Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another third free virtual Thursday in which the Foss Waterway Seaport opens its virtual doors and physical doors to allow you free access to get to see the treasures with inside. I'm your guide tonight, Chris Stottinger, and we are going to be looking at kind of a departure from our normal thing. Instead of something hyper Tacoma local and specific, the Seaport has embarked on this partnership recently and is curating some artifacts that are important to the Tacoma story, but didn't necessarily come from Tacoma originally. And the two things that we're looking at in particular tonight are this, a 1938 triple cockpit runabout by Chris Craft and a 1949 Seabody Buick Estate Wagon. And what do both of these things have in common? Well, I'm glad you asked. They're both not boats. Uh, one of them is, the other is not. But they have a, a fascinating connection. And as a luxury item, sort of transitioned in the American story at the same time. And so tonight, we're going to kind of explore this relationship that America and Tacoma in particular really had with wood manufacturing and how that transitioned from an everyday labor item into an extreme luxury item into something that you just didn't see around anymore to where it is really today, which is an extreme collector's item. So I think that's that's the best interlude I can really give to this. As always, uh, we are live, and if you guys have questions, please let me know. I am happy to answer them, and it is great to see you all as well. So come on down. Let's go on a voyage through wood, wheels, and the great American story. So like I said, we've got these two these two exhibits that are down in the seaport. The 1949 Buick Estate Wagon is actually on loan, and it is part of the partnership that the Foss Waterway Seaport is fostering with uh, LeMay, America Car Museum. And for those of you who don't know, uh, LeMay, America's Car Museum, is just off of I-5. It's another one of the museum core here in Tacoma, Washington. And it is, it's massive. I think it's like 1, 165,000 square feet of facility. Uh, the last I heard, they had approximately 3,000 cars in the collection, and they are an engagement, education, and inspiration facility that really focuses not just on the, the cars that are there, but sort of the automotive history of the area and greater America. And they're, without a doubt, one of the 10 best car museums in the United States. This is what the facility looks like from the exterior. And of course, this was founded by Harold and Nancy LeMay, who privately amassed the largest privately owned automotive collection in the United States. Uh, and then at its peak, yeah, I think it had just about 3,000. I don't have an exact number, but approximately a lot of cars. And the LeMay Car Museum came out of that passion project and is the facility that there is today. And there's merger now between LeMay and Foss has given us the wooden wheels exhibit in there today. And for me, I like to think of this as sort of a greater narrative to the whole Tacoma experience, because when this uh, area was originally, you know, founded by the, the white settlers that were coming out here that were taking over the land, it was prized for its lumber. And the major areas where you have Tacoma development today began as individual lumber camps. And Old Tacoma, Old Town Tacoma, was a lumber mill. And when you go down there, like Dickman Mill Park today, those wooden pylons that are out in the water are the remnants of those original lumber mills that made this such an important economic hub. The shipping industry also got its huge start from lumber there. And it was just, of course, the building material of choice because it was plentiful and it was remarkable too. You know, when you're out working with old growth Douglas fir in particular, 
uh, you've got this really incredible wood that has astounding properties. It's strong, it's resilient. In a lot of cases, it's naturally pest and waterproof. And so you can do a lot with that. And when it grows, you know, 500, 600 feet tall, and all you have to do is chop it down and roll it down a hill, it made for a very uh, lucrative industry. And where the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum is located today, that was, you know, part of what was once the longest uh, shipping grain warehouse, just about a mile long in the United States. I'm trying to think, I've got a good picture of it here. Yeah. So you can see, that was all shipping facility and those big tall ships would come right down and could onload, offload grain, lumber, any sort of cargo directly off of the railroad and then send it globally around the world. Today, the seaport building is that last remaining link, the only one that hasn't burned down and you can still see inside of it all of that, that history there. So wood is a, a good topic for the area. Now, if you're curious what Tacoma would have looked like pre, pre lumber camps, it's hard to find historic photos of it, honestly. But luckily, we have Point Defiance. If you go out to Point Defiance Park on the northernmost end of the Tacoma Peninsula, you'll be gifted with a 600 or a, I'm sorry, a 760 acre city park that has original old growth forest inside of it. And because this area was spared from development, it is now a huge educational area where people can see those original old growth trees out there. And in some cases, there are trees out there that are over 500 years old. So it really is a perfect time capsule of pre-lumber Tacoma. From there, you get your next sort of link in the chain actually down in the seaport where they focus on these traditional hand-built wooden craft from a variety of backgrounds. And this one right here is actually one of the Foss Maritime launches. This one in particular was built in the area, served in the waters of Commencement Bay, and now resides not far from where it used to work and play, right here in the Foss Waterway Seaport. But tonight we're kind of looking at this transition, right? from when everything was made of wood and used as a working craft to when it became something that was really just for the rich. And then it's brief transition back to the, the common working man's boat or car. And we're starting with this. So the wooden station wagon, uh, or as it's more colloquially known these days, the woody was purely a commercial vehicle. And this was at the beginning of the automotive industry where you would buy essentially just the, the chassis and like the engine. And then if you wanted to build a car, you did it out of wood because you had all these skilled carpenters in the area. Wood was a plentiful resource. And so you would end up with something like this. And the original station wagon actually gets its name from the fact that they were used to shuttle passengers from the train station to hotels. And that was the train station wagon. And as they transitioned away from horse-drawn carriages to the, the more dependable in a lot of ways wagons here, you would end up with these wooden bodied cars like the one featured here. And they would have been prevalent to places like this. So what used to occupy the entire city block on A Street between 9th and 10th, downtown Tacoma, was the Tacoma Hotel. Uh, this unfortunately burned down in the 1930s, so you cannot see it today. But the area where it used to reside, you can see uh, we have this stunning colorized photograph of it. And in fact, for my eagle-eyed friends out here, you can actually see the totem pole as well, uh, which was removed from Fireman's Park just last year. And then just beyond that, you can actually see the top of the, the warehouse section. So in the like middle right-hand side of this photograph, that is a continuation of the storage facility that is now the Foss Waterway Seaport. Here it is looking up there. But this is where it would have been located. Um, on A Street, just up the hill from Dock Street, basically right between 9th and 10th. And then I've got an arrow pointing to where 
the seaport building is to get today. So the the original wooden station wagons of Tacoma would have traversed this section a lot. And the train station was just down the street on Pacific Avenue for a long period of time. And for a while, it was actually down pretty much where Dock Street is. Uh, when originally, so here's a little more historic look at where the Fosswater Seaport would have been built. Just down the train tracks from here would have been this. Uh, this is from 1885, and this would have been the area of the Blackwell Hotel, considered Tacoma or New Tacoma's first hotel. And this definitely would have been a major station for those those um, station wagons to go back and forth to take people to this hotel directly from the train. And to give you some context on how much stuff has changed, so where the Tacoma Hotel used to be, it now looks like this. This is currently on A Street. And where the Seaport building is today, you can see in the background there, the clock tower of Old City Hall and the rotunda up there of the original Northern Pacific Railroad headquarters. Both of those in their original way right here from the 1890s. Here they are today. So some things have changed pretty dramatically. Some things have not. But as that transition happened, right? So you're buying cars, building wooden bodies on them, and they were just being used to shuttle people back and forth. Train station to hotel, bomb and bomb. From there, it starts to become a more kind of desirable thing that everyone wants to have an automotive carriage. So then we get the estate wagon, where now instead of just something that everybody kind of the poor man uses to shuttle passengers from the train station, now this is a luxury item that only the rich can afford. And so you get something like this, uh, which is really a look at the first estate wagon, where people would go out to their grander estates and have instead of a horse-drawn carriage, Something like this, again, with a predominantly wooden body, but a high more concentration of steel in this one. And that's the beginning of that transition there, where uh, this is from downtown Tacoma in 1920, when the last of sort of the blacksmith farriers and carriage makers were really functioning in downtown Tacoma. And in the 1920s, you see that transition now from predominantly uh, wooden bodied cars starting to get into more and more steel manufacturing. And as that transition happens, we're getting closer and closer to this era here where you're gonna end up with something like the 1949 Buick estate wagon. Now I like this picture here because I think it gives a good representation of what we're talking about. Because when you look up at the rafters of the seaport building, those trusses up there, you're looking at the stamp of the time. I feel like I talk about it all the time, but as these carpenters and railroad workers were coming out to the Tacoma area, they had already developed a skill set building trestle bridges across the US as they were trying to connect the East and the West Coast for the first time with the trains. And so when they got here and they were building this grain storage facility, they used that exact same technology and skill set to build the trestles at the top of this building here. And those are the original old growth Douglas fir beams still up there today. And I like it because it's now framing this collection of handcrafted wooden boats and our, our estate wagon here, which is another uh, wooden artisan craft there. So here's a look. This is the 1922 Ford Model T depot hack or, uh, you know, station wagon. This was something that was going from a train depot to a hotel. And then it transitions a little bit more uh, with this one here. But originally these were working vehicles. And this was... I think my my favorite of the sort of working man's truck that you would have found. These were hardworking downtown designed to just sh shuttle people or carry goods. And they were trucks originally, pickups, delivery vehicles that had wooden bodies. And it was the cheapest thing to do. But as the lumber industry starts to eat up its own resources, you start to see a transition there. So this is from 1888 with the St. Paul and Tacoma Lumber Company, uh, right down on the Tide Flats in Tacoma. 
And you can see this is 1907, uh, a, a logging camp just outside of Tacoma city limits today. This was a massive old growth forest. And within a very short period of time, uh, this is 1910, these lumber workers and lumberjacks came through and essentially clear cut the area leading to a lack of lumber in the area and now a transition into more affordable, more bountiful materials. And to give you a good snapshot of this, this is essentially where 30th Street is today in Old Town Tacoma. This was the original uh, area with Tacoma that Job Carr came out and founded in 18. 73 and in 1873 you can already see they had done a tremendous amount of work to clear cut the trees out of this area here there's just a few up there on the horizon still but it would have all been dense old growth forests the way that it used to be you know to time immemorial the way that you still see it out at point defiance today and i think that's such a stark juxtaposition to go from like the beginning of five mile drive out into Ruston, you see just how much has changed because of the lumber industry out here. So that's the beginning of the station wagon. It is a working vehicle carrying people from train stations to hotels, and it's easy to do. There's a ton of people who are skilled at making the body of an automobile out of wood, and it's no big deal. But as lumber and skill sets start to diminish in the 1920s and 30s, you see now this transition to it's something that only the wealthy can afford. And so more and more like mahogany is being used and mostly just as accents in a lot of vehicles instead of building the entire body out of it. By the time we get to the 1940s, it is kind of really at its peak. And then into, I believe, the 1950s, you really don't see much done in wood anymore. And a big part of that was... World War II, uh, the development of anything that wasn't for the war effort hits a complete halt during the 1940s. And then at the conclusion of World War II, you see this explosion of spending with the, the baby boomer era, the development of the federal highway, uh, of people trying to take large families out on vacations. And so now there's a resurgence of the station wagon which was a design that they already had, but now it's no longer got wood involved in it. This is something that's assembled on a, an assembly line made out of steel and then sent out onto the roadway. So in that sort of era from the 1940s into the 1950s, the, the wooden bodied Woody, the station wagon really starts to disappear. And this is kind of a transitional one. This is a 1946 Willys Jeep station wagon. Uh, <clears throat> this was produced during World War II, and it was one of the few ones that was using like faux wood uh, touch-ups or just elements to kind of harken back to the time when everything was made out of wood and people were still feeling nostal nostalgic about it. And then this is a post-World War II example right here of a station wagon that's using completely faux wood, just as accents. It's not at all important to the development or structure of this. And one of the things that really drove that change too, is that wood is not just expensive, but it's heavy and loud and uh, doesn't necessarily hold up to the vibrations and just pounding that are happening, happening on the roads around the United States. So it becomes expensive to maintain a wooden vehicle. It becomes expensive to produce a wooden vehicle. And it just gets to the point where the people that remembered them don't care anymore or aren't around to, to keep that alive. And so they just get relegated to junkyards. You see all these woodies disappear because they're now considered garbage vehicles. And the arrival of the faux wooden station wagon hits America's roads like a thunderous force. Until in the 1960s, like all things, it just took a, a group of young people out having fun to make something cool again. So surfers in California in the 1960s were buying these old woodies, these old wooden bodied station wagons that had been tossed in junkyards. 
They're buying them for nothing because they're inexpensive and they're broke. And they're like, oh, you know what? These are perfect for Holland surfboards. And so there's this resurgence of poor surfers hauling around their surfboards in station wagons, wooden ones. And the woody hits a whole like renaissance again, because now people are like, oh man, that's a sexy car. I want to be more like that. So this is kind of the explosion of the Woody as a collector's item now. Now people are like, okay, I'm into this. And pop culture takes off with it, right? So these aren't getting restored the way that like a collector's item would today, but it extended the life and just general longevity of a lot of these Woodies. And it's also where the term Woody is coined. Uh, it starts showing up in songs like Beach Boys Surf and Safari and just in like the way that people are talking about it at the time. And so this brings back sort of the romanticized version of the wooden bodied station wagon out there. Then in the 1970s, the Woody becomes an official collector's item when in 1973, a guy named Will O'Neill out of California, of course, starts, yes, the National Woody Club, which despite what you may think from the initial title is a car club for Woody enthusiasts. And since that time, you can, I mean, just look at the steady, dramatic increase in the price of the Woody since then. And because there were only a few of them made in their like peak years in the 1940s, it is a, a very uh, sought after, very limited, highly collectible item that you have today. So I'm just checking the comments here, making sure yeah, so I feel like a lot of people, right? This is the station wagon that they remember growing up with. No seat belts, cruising down the highway, uh, and then either real or faux wood on the side, depending where you were in both like geographically and the history of the time. So as you see the resurgence of the Woody out there, now we get something like this. Uh, so this is the 1949 C-bodied um, Buick that is currently down in the Fosswater Seaport today on loan from the LeMay Car Museum. And Buick was one of the last like car manufacturers to produce a car with real wood incorporated into the body. And in 1949, the sales weren't particularly high for something like this. So they kind of just eked along until about 1953, which is the last time I've seen that they produced a car that had real wood in the body. Um, and from then, uh, I think that was what, 1953 would have been the Buick Roadmaster estate wagon. So this is 1949. It's basically just right before the end of the Woody era. And so that's all just driven by cost. You know, it's costing almost more to produce these vehicles than they're going to get out of it. Uh, the basic price was in the 1940s, $3,178. And that was about $600 more than a Buick super convertible at the time. And again, it's heavier. Uh, this comes in, I think, at 4,490 pounds. So Buick produces 1,847 of the super estate wagon in 1949. And again, that now drives up the fact that this becomes an incredibly rare, highly collectible item for, for the Woody enthusiasts out there in the world today. And this is just, I mean, you can see here, a beautiful example of it out here. And I've got some footage of it from down at the seaport. So you can take a look here. Let's see if I can pull that up really quick. Here you go. So the exhibit is going to really talk about that partnership between um, wood in the pleasure industry and seeing that juxtaposition between cars and boats. And right now, the 1949 Buick Estate Wagon is down in the Fosswater Seaport, and you can just see the beauty of that wood, right? Like there's something magical about the way that wood looks, the way that it catches the light, and like it just feels alive 
But I love that you get to see that down there nestled into all of that same um, warm wood texture of all the handcrafted boats down on the floor of the museum. such a good looking car. So yeah, if it was the 1970s, very likely uh, fake wood on the side there. You really don't see more wood coming out into the automotive industry past the early 1950s. So this is one part of the exhibit today. Now, the second part that I'm really excited about once it's down there in the seaport is going to be the, the Christcraft boat. And it's unfortunately not in the seaport yet. It's on its way down there, but nothing is predictable anymore. And the world is topsy-turvy, so we just do what we can with it. But uh, you can go down and see the, the estate wagon right now. And then you can, you're about to see the, the Chris Craft boat down there. And this is the one where I think there's a real Tacoma connection to everything because Tacoma was, I mean, it's still the fifth largest port in the United States, but it used to be a major hub for the production of boats and in particular, wooden hold boats and ships. And so a lot of you are probably familiar with this right here. So this is from... Uh, the far east side of Commencement Bay, Port of Tacoma area. Um, this was our, our main uh, shipping area down here, where in the 1930s into the 1940s, we were creating a huge amount of ships to go out and serve, mostly as um, cargo ships and support ships during World War II. <laughs> But you might not be as familiar with the fact that a lot of these shipwrights had large-scale companies here in Tacoma way earlier than that. This is one of the earliest ones. This is uh, Stephen Barber, who was a Croatian immigrant and originally located at the foot of Carr Street in Old Town, Tacoma. He had a, a shipwright facility out here where he would build uh, mostly fishing, fishing boats and fishing ships at the time. And eventually they end up creating a large enough industry that they move in 1919 down into the tide flats, into the main Port of Tacoma area that we have today and produce large scale fishing boats. And it's, it's that original production of working vessels that sets Tacoma on the map. And again, that's how it was. People had cheap lumber, they had skill sets that they were ready to use, and it was just easier to get a bunch of shipwrights or carpenters together and make a, a working vessel, which is essentially the success of the Foss maritime industry, right? The Foss family sets themselves up down on the waterway, which we now call the Foss waterway. They buy a couple rowboats early on, and then from there expand into actually building their own uh, pleasure launches, rowboats, and eventually tugboats. And all of that is going on down there where these are just vessels designed for work. You know, there's nothing, nothing that we would deem luxurious about them uh, for the time. Even though now you look at something like this, one of the original Salmon Beach Boathouse Foss launches, and you're like, wow, that is a good looking boat. Um, then you start to see, I think the Willits brothers for me are kind of the, the transitional one here, right? Where they start as just functional canoes, but really you can't look at a Willits canoe and not think of it as a luxury item. The fact that these were handmade, uh, red cedar strips, copper nails all throughout. This they're, they're probably on the boundary between luxury pleasure item and functional boat. But really at its heart, Tacoma, this is across the Foss waterway looking up into the city of Tacoma uh, in 1942. And this is the Petrick Shipbuilding Corporation. So you can see Tacoma has always been a ship 
building facility and creating wooden boats to do it. And Chris Craft was a, a 90 degree turn from that narrative where Chris Craft begins, um, I guess you could say in the 1860s, when Christopher Columbus Smith, I kid you not, that's his name, uh, out of Michigan, starts building these little wooden uh, skiffs or punts and like just making fishing boats for friends. And he develops such a reputation for being good at it that people start trying to buy bigger and bigger boats. And so they go through a few name changes, but eventually Chris Craft becomes the official name of the company and they market themselves as, you know, the, the company that brings power boats to, to the working man. And one of the things that made them so successful is they applied the Henry Ford assembly line mentality to wooden boat building. So <clears throat> they, they start their industry out in Michigan there. Uh, by 1884, Chris gets married and they raise up their kids to start working in the boat shop and they create this whole kind of history of making power boats that were affordable for people who normally would have never been able to achieve something like this, right? In 1906, they start building these 26 foot power boats that could reach speeds of up to 18 miles an hour, which was remarkably fast for the time. Uh, although not as fast as in 1910, when a guy named John Ryan specifically seeks out Christopher Columbus Smith to build a boat that could reach 30 miles an hour. And uh, they design essentially this, the first of the Chris Craft hydroplanes. And in, I think, 1910, this was only $20,000, which is crazy. But uh, they put this huge... Uh, essentially airplane engine inside this bad boy here. And it's just about 26 feet long with a 250 horsepower Sterling engine and became the award-winning wooden hold hydroplane for the time. And that launches them to national stardom. Chris Craft starts producing in mass throughout the 1920s, these wooden hold power boats for everybody. And that's where you start to see the transition from just a work vehicle to, oh, boats can be fun too. So uh, when something was only available to the wealthy, now accessible to anyone, you see a huge spike in that popularity. But unfortunately, the exact same thing that happened to the station wagon, a state wagon, happens to the Chris Craft powerboat, where they go into the 1930s during the Great Depression, and you see a dramatic decline in purchasing power for a lot of people, but the super wealthy are still buying them. So they turn more to custom boats and racing boats until in the 1940s, there's just a complete change in companies, company policy because, of course, World War II. And when World War II begins uh, in 1939, Chris Craft pivots completely to creating essentially rescue boats and patrol boats for the U.S. Navy. Uh, and it wasn't until 1945 that they start again by trying to launch a new line of civilian pleasure craft. So these are some of the ads that Chris Craft has really launched their industry on, um, not just in making the, the excitement and thrill of the boating life accessible to the common man, but also of doing really custom high-end builds for celebrities like Katherine Hepburn and Frank Sinatra. And so throughout the 1940s, you see a lot of like, this is my favorite, going sporty from 1940, where these wooden hold pleasure boats are now for anyone. And they're also remarkable because they're one of the few boating companies that uh, instituted a payment plan. So if you were going to buy one of these, you didn't have to pony up all at front. You could actually spread that out over time. And so you see this resurgence now of more and more wooden boats coming out in the area. And so the one that's coming down to the Fosswatery Seaport is a 1938, and it's kind of a pivotal one. Um, 
I've got a video clip of this particular, not the exact one, but the same model, uh, the 1938 22 foot triple cockpit cockpit runabout. Wow. It's much harder to say than it needs to be. Listening to this bad boy purr, you'll understand. <laughs> So of course, Chris Craft becomes super successful at the time. They're selling those dazzling mahogany hold power boats for six easy payments of whatever, whatever. And the ads that they're running at the time look like this. So suddenly everybody's buying Chris Craft wooden boats until in the 1950s, um, fi fiberglass really takes over. Fiberglass or uh, glass wool, as non-trademark name, comes about in the 1930s, and you start to see more and more applications into the pleasure industry uh, throughout the 1940s, early 1950s. And I think it was in the mid-1950s that Chris Craft starts to make their first fiberglass hold power boats, and because they're so much more affordable to make, you don't have to do them all by hand, which is how they were making their mahogany ones up to that point. Uh, you can essentially mass produce them, sell them for considerably less, and they require less maintenance and care. And so now, the same way that the steel-bodied Buicks take over, fiberglass hold power boats become the norm. And there are a few exceptions to that. Um, Chris Craft is also making a line of... Where are they here? Uh, metal bodied. Uh, this was their 1955 Cobra, which was a steel hold ship or uh, powerboat. And then this kind of had to compete for a little while with the fiberglass, but eventually fiberglass takes over completely. And you see the big change there because this is the kind of detail and level of care that you get inside the 1930s Chris Craft commuters runabouts and cadets uh, with an engine like that, that's a um, 250 horsepower V8 that would have been standard in the 1930 Chris Crafts. Uh, and you see sort of this departure from these luxury, you know, uh, day sailing power boats out there, or like this one here into more of a mass produced fiberglass hull. And that is the, the departure. The last big push that Chris Craft had for their wooden holes was with their cadets. And the Chris Craft cadet, unfortunately, just never took off the way they intended it to because it was pre-World War II and it just couldn't catch the way that they wanted it to. I do have a, a clip for you here. I want you guys to appreciate the majesty and the craftsmanship of these two vehicles that we get to talk about down at the seaport. I'm going to show you one quickly of inside sort of the cockpit of a 1938 Chris Craft, and then I want to show you briefly a clip um, of the 1949 Buick Estate Wagon, not the specific one at the seaport, but one of the same year and design cruising around on the road. We have the control knob and the on-off switch for the spotlight right here. You have your running lights, which includes your bow light, your instrument lights, and your mass light back at the transom. Right here, this switch is your built pump manual override. We have a horn in the center of the steering wheel. We have a key switch, which is ignition on only. It does not crank. You have to go over here to this button on the far right hand side, and that is your crank button. You can hear it will crank the engine, and that's how you'll start it. Always make sure to kick your key back off. In between the two, you have a bilge blower. Obviously, it's a good idea to turn that on before you fire it off. 
And then this is your throttle. This is slow, this is fast. That's back to idle. You have a transmission shifter with a detent mechanism to give it a positive lock for use with the new engine. This is neutral, this is reverse, back to neutral, forward. Pretty easy to do, pretty seamless. Make sure that you are in neutral before you go to start it, although it will not start in any gear but neutral. They're just so good looking. Uh, I myself, I grew up sort of out by the Lake Coeur d'Alene area. And whenever we'd go out during the summer, there were a couple Chris Crafts that were out on the lake. And you could just tell the people who were like, oh, yeah, that's a good looking boat. And it has now become absolutely something just of the, the wealthy. I don't know anyone who's buying a hand-built mahogany boat from the 1930s just off an assembly line anymore so it's definitely something that has gone back to a rare collector's item uh i want to be able to share with you guys a clip of that 1949 buick estate wagon out on the road there Just a good looking car cruising around out there. So Chris Craft, Buick, uh, both managed to weather that transition. Uh, here's the, this is a, a model of the 1938 tr uh, triple cockpit runabout from Chris Craft that's going to be in the seaport uh, some point here very soon. We are actually fortunate enough to have some uh, generous help from King Salmon Marine here in Tacoma, who are custom building a, a dolly so that that boat can actually be transported into the seaport. Because uh, unlike the estate wagon, you can't just drive it into the seaport. Although a hydraulic lift, not a bad idea. It's my recommendation. I'm sure that's super easy to build, right? So I think understanding that transition from when uh, I think it's easier to conceptualize with boats, right? Like wooden hold boats were absolutely the norm. They floated <laughs> and they were easy to build. There was a plentiful resource with lumber in the area. And it was something that people had a skill set to make. And it was an easy transition for people to do cars that way, to just buy essentially that core auto kit with the engine and the chassis and then build the rest of the body out of wood because it was affordable and you had the opportunity to employ a, a labor force you already had to do it. And then as both of those become more desirable items every day, like cars were something became more common for everyone, uh, more and more boats were coming out for people in the area, both as pleasure and work craft. And so you start to see that departure from wood now into steel and fiberglass because it's a more affordable material. and you can do it uh, through machines. You know, you don't have to have something hand built by a skilled artisan. So there's that sweet spot in the late 30s, throughout the 40s and early 50s, where things that were made out of wood were made pretty much exclusively for, for the elite. And it wasn't until they got junked and then picked up by cool influencers like surfers in California that they became something trendy again. And then in the 1970s, you see really the collectors go bananas for stuff that would have been created in the 30s and 40s. You now just can't find anymore. So there is a great example 
of something truly exciting to see down at the seaport. It's one of many exhibits that they highlight down there. And I encourage you guys to go down when you have an opportunity in person and learn a little bit more, not just about the area, but about everything going on. Tonight would not have been possible without, of course, the generous support of Columbia Bank, uh, Port of Tacoma, Tacoma Creates, and our newfound partnership with LeMay, America's Car Museum. So be sure to go check them out as well. They offer quite a lot there, and uh, I'm always excited to see what people are doing downtown. For me, though, that's it for tonight. If you have questions, please let me know. I'm always excited to talk Tacoma, and I'm Really looking forward to seeing you guys throughout the remainder of the year. We have some very exciting stuff coming up. I can't wait to share it with you. Until then, thank you guys. Have a fantastic night and keep on exploring.